<laughs> well, thank you for that. That's good before I start. <laughs> Can I just pray? Father, I want to thank you for your word. I thank you that in your word you give us so much guidance for the whole of life. And I pray, Lord, that as I share this morning, I will share what you have given, that I will only share what you want me to share. Lord, would you just block from my sight anything that's written down that you don't want me to say. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I want to want us to think this morning about the importance of praying together. I've got a couple of questions just to start with. Who finds prayer really easy all of the time? That's what I thought. Neither do I. <laughs> Second question. When a prayer meeting is announced, what's your reaction? Oh, great. Can't wait to be there. Or is it, mm, well, I might. Or, no, that's not for me because I can't pray very well. Well, my aim this morning is to try to persuade you of the importance and the value of praying together. Why talk about that this morning? Is it because our prayer meetings, attendance and the prayer life of LCC is awful? No. In comparison with many other churches that I know, we do pretty well. However, we must never become complacent about that. I'm talking about it today because tomorrow we start our week of prayer. And there will be plenty of opportunities during the week to meet with others to pray. And my aim this morning is to encourage you to do just that. We have a prayer meeting here tomorrow evening at 7.30 in the small hall. There's another one at half past six Friday morning um, in the small hall. And during the week, there are various prayer hubs in people's homes on different days and various times. And there's plenty of space for people to sign up for that. And if you haven't done that already, do see Jack at the end of the meeting because he will guide you through Church Street to, go, to sign up for that. If your life group is having a prayer hub this week instead of normal life group, you don't need to sign up for your own life group. But if you want to go to another one, then do sign up. And then on Saturday, Judith is going to lead us in some prayer journaling, again in the small hall. And then Saturday afternoon, there's a prayer walk um, starting at Kensington Gardens. So if you want to go to either of those, again, see Jack, sign up. There's plenty of room for people to sign up. But as well as all of that, I passionate, passionately believe that praying together is vital for the life of LCC. My prayer for LCC is and has been for a long time that our prayer meetings will be so powerful that we'll all want to be there and that the small hall will not be big enough to accommodate us. If our prayer meetings are going to be really powerful, we want as many people as possible, and that means we need to be in here because that room's not big enough. That's my passion. That's what I want to see, and I believe that's what God wants. So I'm on a mission this morning to convince you that God has sovereignly ordained the corporate praying of a church in such a way that his mighty workings always increase in amazing ways and his purposes are accelerated when we pray together. Now, please don't get me wrong. My intention is never to minimize personal prayer. And I appreciate that there are very good reasons why some people will never be able to get to a prayer meeting. But my intention this morning is to help you to see that personal prayer on its own will not result in the working of God to the degree that's needed for spiritual, transfer, spiritual transformation in our lives, in our church, 
in our town and in our nation. And let's look at the beginning of the church in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verses 37 and 38. Now, when they heard this, what they heard was Peter finishing his sermon with these words. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then verse 41, So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Wow, what a sermon. <laughs> and then verse 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. Signs and wonders, belief, generosity, worship, hospitality, praise, unity, and evangelistic growth. Do you want LCC to be like the Church of Acts? The excitement of signs and wonders, of favor and awe, new believers being added daily. All of that can cause us to overlook the first church's commitment to prayer. You see, for the early church, prayer was not an afterthought. It wasn't the Christian way to start and end a meeting. Prayer was not an add-on to the real work of the apostles. Prayer was central for them, and it has to be central for us now. Prayer is essential for LCC. I'll probably say that several times. It's because I believe it. Prayer is essential for LCC. We've been through some tough times. Some folks are still going through tough times. We're coming into a new season where I believe God wants to do something really special amongst us. I trust we all want God to have his way in our individual lives and in the life of LCC corporately. And we saw in our series on Nehemiah that we are all to be involved in building the church as God wants it to be built. We all have a responsibility to see God's plan for this church to grow and glorify him. And the key word is together. Very simply, none of us can do it alone. We are all in this together. We cannot leave it to our elders and our deacons and expect it all to happen. We all have a role to play. We all have a stake in what God is wanting to do with LCC. None of us should think, oh, well, I can just sit on the sidelines with nothing to do. I can just watch the main players on the field. They'll do a good job. God wants us all to be involved. And we can all be involved because prayer is the most important thing we can do for LCC. And we can all pray. Yes, we can. 
we can all pray. You may be wondering, well, what should we be praying about? You may even wonder, well, I don't really know how to pray. I felt like that sometimes. You know, prayer is important, but I'm really quite sure how to go about it. It's a bit like the story of a daughter and her mother that I read the other day. The mother had put together a really special dinner for some friends because her husband had invited them round for a meal. She'd worked hard all day preparing the food, and her daughter was watching very closely. And eventually the time came, they were all sat down for the meal, and it was time for somebody to say the blessing over the meal. And mum looked at her daughter and she said, why don't you say the blessing tonight? And she looked at her mum and she said, but mm, I don't think I know how to pray. Mum said, well, you've heard me pray before. Just pray one of the prayers you've heard me pray. Okay, said the daughter. She thought for a moment. And then she prayed, Oh, Lord, why on earth did I ever invite all of these people for dinner? <laughs> and we laugh at that, don't we? But listen, God wants to hear from you even when you're not sure what to pray or how to pray. And likewise, God wants to hear from us as LCC as we pray together, whether we're sure of what to pray or not. God wants us all to pray as a church. He not only wants to hear from you as an individual, he wants to hear from all of us as LCC family gathering together. And many Christians think their prayer life is a very personal thing. And for the most part, that is true. Sadly, some use that as an excuse to never ever be part of a public prayer meeting. But Jesus knew the power of praying together. Jesus wanted his disciples to pray together as a group of believers. And he demonstrated that in how he prayed. The future of the church relies heavily, I believe, on us praying together. All that's needed is for us to be willing to come and talk with the Lord and pray for his people. We don't have any rules about prayer. We simply want to seek him and honor him with what's on our hearts. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 18, verses 19 and 20. He said this, Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. How often have I heard, how often have I quoted, where two or three are gathered in my name as a kind of comforting thought? Well, Jack and I have said it, putting the chairs out for a prayer meeting. How many chairs should we put out tonight, Jack? Well, I don't know. Um, but if there's only two or three, God will be here. And that's true. But we missed the point. If two of you agree about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Friends, there is power in praying together. Whether it's two, twenty, two hundred, or two thousand, there is power when people pray together. And I want to, to bring three proofs, if you like, from the Word of God that establish the important need for all who are believers to become a part of the prayer gatherings of the church. I'm going to look at some scriptures that establish something that's simple and yet profound and stirring. Praying churches are used of God to change the world. First of all, praying together was a priority for the apostles. In Acts chapter 6, 
the church in Jerusalem faced one of its first dilemmas. We read in Acts chapter 6 from verse 1 to 5. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint, of, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. And I'd always read that as meaning the apostles delegated ministry responsibilities to others, so they'd be freed up to spend time in personal prayer so that they could receive a fresh word from the Lord to preach to the people. That's not the point of the passage, though. The apostles were not referring to the need for personal, private prayer. They're talking about the ministry of mobilizing the people of God to pray. They were marking out the two ministries they must especially do as church leaders. The whole context of those verses revolves around ministries. Verse 1 points out there was a problem with the ministries. The Hellenists, those who spoke Greek, pointed out their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. The Hebrews were doing all right, but the Greeks were being missed out. In verse 2, the apostles discuss what ministries they must do and the ones they must not do. And in verses 3 and 4, instruct that seven men be identified from among the congregation to take on that ministry. You see, the verses are focused on ministry to people, not on personal issues. Verse 4, we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. That highlights to me something very specific and really important. The ministry of prayer and the word go hand in hand. You cannot separate them. I have spent hours in prayer before I dare get up here today. I couldn't do it if I didn't. The example of the apostles in Acts points to the priority praying together held for them. And every occurrence of prayer in Acts before chapter 6 pictures the apostles leading others in prayer. Acts 1 verse 14, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. Acts 1 24, they prayed, they prayed and said, you Lord know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen. Acts 2 42, we read it a few moments ago, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Acts 3, verse 1, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer. Acts 4, verses 23 and 24, believers pray for boldness. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God. And then in verse 31, when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. None of those references point to the, points to their private prayer time. The focus is on God's people praying together. So by testimony and example, it's plain to me that the apostles placed high importance on the people of God praying together. They considered guiding the corporate prayer life of the church 
as just as important a priority as the preaching and teaching of God's word. Secondly, praying together was modelled and practised by Jesus himself. The apostles learnt their leadership patterns from nobody but Jesus. Look through the Gospels for, te- for Jesus' teaching and practice of prayer, and you'll find about 37 verses, some of them repeated in more than one Gospel. But of those 37 instances where Jesus refers to prayer, 33 of them were addressed to a plural rather than a singular audience. In other words, Jesus' instruction decisively leant toward praying with others, not just praying in private. Take, for example, Matthew 7, verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. How often do we read that you and immediately think it's sim- singular, referring to an individual? In fact, it is a plural you, meaning Jesus is urging a gathering of believers to ask, to seek, and to knock. And in other passages, Jesus deliberately emphasized the significance of praying together. Matthew 18, verse 19, I read it a moment ago. I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Jesus could have said, if anyone asks. He deliberately chose to emphasize a group gathered together for prayer. His focus of Jesus on more than one praying indicates there is a design of God in such gatherings, through which he will uniquely and powerfully work. So the apostles made it a practice and a priority to teach about praying with fellow believers and then to practice it. Because they had heard, they had seen Jesus emphasize the very same thing. And thirdly, there is praying together in the New Testament. The book of Acts records the wonderful, mighty works of God through his church in its early years, clearly connects them to unified praying together. The 120 were gathered in an upper room praying in one accord when Pentecost comes. The disciples prayed for wisdom to know who Judas should be replaced with. Peter and John reported the Sanhedrin's threats, and their friends were gathered together, and they cried out to God in one accord for boldness, and the place was shaken where they prayed. The church we read in Acts 6 prayed over the seven men appointed to serve the widows. After James was martyred and Peter was imprisoned by Herod, the church was fervently praying and God miraculously delivered Peter from his cell in Acts chapter 12. While the prophets and teachers were praying and fasting, the Holy Spirit called Paul and Barnabas to go on their first missionary journey in Acts chapter 13. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas were praying and God sent an earthquake that resulted in the conversion of the jailer and then being released. Let me say again, I am not discounting personal private prayer. Scripture does also record instances of personal private prayer. Ananias was praying alone when God instructed him to go to Saul in Acts chapter 9. Peter was alone on the rooftop when he had that wonderful vision leading him to share the gospel with a Gentile named Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Nevertheless, the majority of God's recorded workings came when his people prayed together. 
And we also see the part that praying together has played in history. There are many examples of how corporate prayer was the springboard for the sweeping movements of God. Read the records of the revivals. They all started with people praying. All of them. Not one of them just blew up out of nowhere. People had prayed, sometimes for years, but they prayed together, earnestly seeking God. The Moravian revival, the revival under David Brainard, Whitfield and the Wesleys, the revivals in 1857 and 59, revivals with, under Moody and Sankey, the awakening in Wales in 1904, the revival here in Lowestoft in 1921 happened because people prayed. All of them were preceded by much prayer. And in answer to the prayers of people gathering together, God answered by pouring out a huge blessing. Right now, the gospel is spreading the globe at a tremendous rate. I read some statistics the other day that said most of the people who have ever been saved in history were saved during the 20th century. It's suggested that as high as 70% of the total number of people who've been saved throughout world history have come to Christ in the last 100 years. Now listen to this one. 70% of that number has been saved since 1945. And one other observation that blew my mind. 70% of those saved since 1945 were saved since 1990. That's how fast the gospel is spreading in our world. In almost every quarter of the globe, Christianity is advancing. What's the common denominator? Christians spend time in prayer together. Look at what God is doing in Korea, in China, in India, in Eastern Africa. Behind the scenes, you will find prayer meetings. When Wesley prayed, England was revived. When John Knox prayed, Scotland was refreshed. All true revivals have been born in prayer. Many of you know that I belong to a Glow International. You may, know, may not know that it started as Women's Aglow in America in 1967. Do you know how it started? It started with four ladies gathering around a kitchen table, praying. Because they knew there was more. They knew there was more. The first meeting was held in Seattle in 1967. It started with just women. It now includes men who meet as men of Issachar groups. And that's why it's now called a Glow International. And a Glow International now has groups meeting in over 170 nations of this world. And every single time and a glow group is established, it always starts with prayer. Lowestoft a glow started in the year 2000, but for a whole year to 18 months before that, ladies were meeting in homes in Lowestoft, praying and seeking God. And that's been replicated in every instance where there is an a glow international group. This church was birthed in prayer. Talk to Mike. Talk to Joan about it. They'll tell you about those prayer meetings. I wasn't privileged to be part of that. And I guess I know what you're thinking right now. Our prayer meetings don't seem to convey that sort of power. 
And a lot of the time, you're right. Sometimes you're wrong. Some of our prayer meetings have been very powerful. What can we do about making them all powerful? <laughs> Let's gather together and pray, folks. My prayer is that we will see during this coming week many of us gathering together to pray. Whether that be in the hubs around the town, in people's homes, in small groups, or whether it be at the prayer meetings in the small hall. But from this week of prayer, my earnest desire is that our corporate prayer life will increase massively. I am confident that if we play our part, God will answer and we will be astounded at what he will do among us and through us. Not just here in LCC, but in our town and further afield as well. John says in 1 John 5, verse 14, this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. James says in James chapter 4, verse 2, you do not have because you do not ask. May it never be said of LCC that we do not have because we do not ask. God graciously gave us the example of the early church as we saw in Acts chapter 2. He gave us that to spur us on more than 2,000 years later. May we never forget the power and the priority of praying together. May our life groups, may our running partners, may everything we do in LCC be known for prioritizing praying together. So my challenge to all of us this morning is, will you commit to joining together to pray? Dare I say, see you tomorrow night over in the small hall at half past seven. Let's pray. Father God, you have ordained that your people should pray. Help us, Father, to set prayer as the priority in our individual lives and in our corporate life as the family of LCC. Amen.